thank you for bringing your warmth so that we can play. Mm -hmm. I'm a young Filipina in the early 1990s, full-lit mestiza, one-quarter Chinese, Asiatic black penai, and Latina Filipina, full lips, wide hips, long legs. Mm. I'm always beautiful, but you don't know what's beyond these eyes, this face, my effing freckles. I'm one of millions of women who inherited a first-generation urban American legacy. Mine included civil rights activists, brown-skinned hippies, writers, musicians, artists, dancers, who occupied the streets of San Francisco with their performance, and who occupied the streets of San Francisco when they closed down the International Hotel, which was packed to the brims with our elders, our manongs, the restaurant chef, my grandfather. And they occupied the state universities for ethnic studies, so eventually my cousins and my husband could major and minor in Asian American studies and African American studies, and my brothers and I could walk out of traditional schooling and walk on to our innate paths of learning and service. I'm a grown-up unschooler, and like all kids who were given the opportunity to follow their educational heart's delight, I don't have a database that tells me how things should and should not be done. I actually don't have someone telling me what's feasible and what's not feasible sitting on my shoulders. I just kind of do whatever I want. We all have this experiential understanding that everything is just a learning curve. But I live with a deep understanding that there's a massive amount of experience that goes unclaimed. Like all autodidacts, unschoolers, I have been lucky enough to have all these really rich, learning circumstances that I've come to learn are really exotic for most people, like styling A-list celebrities, helping them, empowering them to dress in ways that allow for creative freedom and movement so they can dance with all the energy coming through them and at them and in them. It taught me that enabling and empowering our innate gesture is really like the most amazing opportunity for us to show up fully taught me to really understand that a gesture is the shape through which we move in the world. Falling in love with my husband at 19 and spending the last 15 years learning how to survive and thrive through 10 years of being pregnant or nursing, learning how to home birth, water birth, studio birth, my little painter. I have a 10-year-old, a 6-year-old, and a 3-year-old. We learned how to cure two near-fatal illnesses naturally, heal from post-traumatic stress from all that, including my husband and my little one, and postpartum depression that came after that. We learned what kinds of conversations and paperwork and legal cartwheels need to go into raising tens of millions of dollars for businesses, initiatives, and nonprofits that we think are really relevant in their communities, and what it actually takes to move resources at the level of community. I'm honored to have co-created values-infused inspired giving plans for those with a collective net worth of $14 billion. How does that happen? Well, no one told me I couldn't do it, so, you know, I just said, well, how do we move resources towards life? For me, that means social justice, environmental initiatives, cultural preservation. So what I want to show you today is that there is a scaffolding, a foundation, there's building blocks that must be in place for the successful fulfillment of a conscious, creative, feminine legacy. So many of you kind of feel sometimes like you're spinning a lot of plates, like so much so that you might spin out of your mind. <laughs> Excellent! That gesture is the key to, like, no-ish magic in the construction of your life work. I'd like to introduce you to a few legacy builders. Rick wanted to open some laser surgery clinics, and so he did, and pretty soon he had 78 of them. Rich worked for Rick, bought the clinics, and flipped them for $120 million. Todd's a DJ, and so he opened a radio syndication where he syndicates celebrity DJs in every genre across the country, and he represents musical artists, and one group went on to win a Grammy. David and Colby are exotic car fanatics, and so they opened their dream exotic car and yacht share with perfect examples of Lamborghini, Ferrari, Porsche, Maserati. And finally, Peter is an MD who invented the open MRI machine and portable USB keychains with our medical records on them. You guys notice anything about them? Men? <laughs> I know them all well, so I assure you they are heart-based entrepreneurs. 
When I ask men if they notice anything, they're like, those people are all on purpose. And they are. Men's hearts are in their targets. And that's really about providing for their loved ones. All men are about providing for their loved ones. And if they feel broken, they're about engaging with the break so they can get back to providing for their loved ones. And Alison Armstrong explains how hunters don't try anything. Because if you tried to hunt a woolly mammoth, you would die. They might still die, but they don't try. Men are all in when it comes to that opportunity to take care. So men, especially beacons, relate to support in a very urgent and immediate way. I need it. I get it. We don't do that at all. We relate to it kind of more like this. Like, in the morning, I got to do my yoga, my 10-year-old hands me my cereal, I have a conference call, I'm trying to do my tree, and my 3-year-old's sitting on my tree, and my 6-year-old's trying to tackle me, and I really have to pee. <laughs> yes? <laughs> right? Because as gatherers, we are biologically called to respond to our environment. Every dish, every stack of papers is a root or a berry that's calling for our, emergent, like our urgent and immediate attention you know, so our people can eat. Our instincts are still calibrated to that ancient past. And yet we try to use a hunter's gesture, but that is not only inefficient, it's not sustainable for long-term vision. It takes so much force to fight that instinctual nature to gather and to multitask that we end up breaking down into disease. And once we're empty, we know that we can't fake it without hurting ourselves and those who support us. But luckily, we're built for massive change. There's no faking needed, because our hearts are in the big picture as we move in this cyclical gesture, touching in on all the areas that are important to us. And we just need to practice the art of sequencing, which is really the art of letting go, knowing that we're going to come back around to the areas that are most important to us. And then we can be where we are, doing what we're doing, which is charisma, which is an excellent response to the gift of feminine leadership. So since our hearts are in the big picture, that's the first part of your foundation, your vision. In Japan, they don't start a business without first making sure they've taken into account the impact on future generations and the planet. And so they start with a long-term, multi-generational plan that's built to last. So what's your 100-year plan? Here's one. Earth is vibrant and green. Her skies are so blue, it smells like lavender and sunshine. Her seas, her waters like eyes are clear and full, and they shimmer with everything that's supposed to be in them, nothing more and nothing less and the dignity of every individual and every individual family culture is honored, respected, and supported. Simple. So what's your impossible promise? The nice thing about living into something like that is 100 years is more than enough time to really mess up something, royally. When I was 20, I had the opportunity to have my fashions featured on the Oprah Network. I was so excited, and I sketched out this kind of like very sexy flapper-style dress, this slip that looked, had like shingles and these transparent um, green squares made out of Japanese seaweed-dried snacks. Because I thought, oh, multitask. This is a perfect opportunity to make some kind of an art statement about like consumables and the ocean and peace. And it was to be topped with this wonton apron of origami paper cranes, because that's a symbol of peace in Japan. And I spent hours the morning of the show baking and folding these things and stringing them together so they would be like squares and triangles and stars and then the cranes. And I was almost moved to tears. I thought it was just so charming and clever. And when I lifted it up, this thread snapped, because of course it weighed like 40 pounds. And everything crashed on the floor. And the slip ended up looking fine. And you know, a week later, the studios were begging me to take this dress back because it smelled like fish and seaweed. <laughs> so, but you know, there's room to play. So what would be the juiciest, most fun, integrity-packed response to the gift of life? Those are your roles, and that's you know, the second part of your foundation. Your scaffolding is your life, the one you already live, in playful, rigorous, and intentional partnership with Source. Women are already dialed in. But there's three ways that we've always accessed the eternal throughout time in all cultures. The first one's kind of obvious. That's your spiritual practice. 
When you have a consistent, fresh spiritual practice, you're receiving downloads all day long, right? You know, this is California. Most of us have a long-term, deeply embedded practice, or we're in a deep inquiry with ourselves about our relationship to spirit, or we have pulled from all the world's great mystery schools to have our own mystery school. Yes, all of that. Excellent. And what happens is when we live with not only our questions, but the questions of our community, and we be responsible for how important our individual dialogue is with source, then our people, the ones we're karmically entwined with, raise their hands and they're like, yes, I want more. They recognize our brand, our flavor of truth. And what's so exciting is they raise their hands to share their downloads. And then at that point, our collaborators, our peers, our elders, our mentors, our students, our clients, they start to blend. And we become this movement of conscious, creative dialogue that propels us through our individual legacies. There's no competition at this point. Your work is always edgy, it's always innovative, and it's always relevant. Because spirit rewards us in the form of truth. The next way that we always access source sounds like two ways, but it's really one, is art and nature. If you're feeling tired in your emotional, spiritual, psychic life, then you want to put yourself in alignment with creator. Do some art. See a gorgeously crafted movie with beautiful mise-en-scene, go to a concert, really enjoy some design. And what happens is source comes in the form of beauty. If you think for a moment of like the hottest person you know, notice what happens in your body, that's dopamine. It's chemical energy, because beauty is energy. Or when you're cooking and the colors start to pop and the garlic wafts up to your nose and the textures come together, you'll notice there's this expansion and this surge. And it can't be assigned to just pride or hunger or the expectation of sharing. It's actually the energy in the beauty. Art feeds the human spirit. And if you're feeling physically tired, like you just don't have enough of you to go around, what you want to do is go put yourself into Earth's physical creation. Because the rawness of her elements, the uh, resistance of her textures, the actual danger and the vibrancy in her green registers in our most minute feminine parts as fresh oxygen and fresh opportunity. It electrifies us at the level of human animal. And so if you're tired, or you want to be one of those people who just seem to have like massive amounts of energy, you want to hook up your outside time. And the next way that we do, the last way, which is potentially super draining, is community. It's draining because as women, we aren't really designed to be rigorous with our social boundaries. And we put ourselves into places where there isn't like an elevated reciprocity of an eight or above. But if it is, just don't go. You don't need to be there. Or show up with a commitment to transform it. When you show up with a commitment to listening to others as a possibility, as someone who wants to be a yes to forward other people's initiatives, people want to be in your space because you are clearing for them to show up how they really want to show up. You appreciate what's most great about them. And at that point, there's no resources that are not available to your initiatives. <coughs> to be clear, money lives in dialogue and play. In our society, we tend to think that resources come from putting our heads down and having like all this like corporate style responsibility and strife and being like responsible individuals that figure out how to do it. But that is so not my experience. I've never seen a check for more than $50,000 exchanged hands or a juicy book deal go through or a much longed for art commission because of what was inside of a contract. It was always 100% of the time because two people that wanted to be friends got together and cooked up a little something something. There was swearing, there was food, there was laughing, right? So that's my experience of how it works. I want to introduce you real quick to another legacy builder. So Roseanne is a former homeschooling mom of three. She co-founded her local co-op and farmer's market. She's a multiple legacy builder, and she was running around in circles with a little tiny health food store and an equal tiny, equally tiny uh, bioregional gluten-free cafe. And she began praying for a, like, a perfect gluten-free baguette that would like, the crust would snap when you broke it, and the inside was fragrant and chewy and moist. And so what she did is she made it her spiritual practice. She brought in her whole family, and every day they were playing with the nature of all these exotic flowers, like millet and tapioca 
And they just like went at it for a couple years. We watched them. It was a big deal. And what happened was she came up with it, and it made her customers insane. She closed her health food store, and she turned her cafe into a community-supported, subscription-based restaurant. And so now what she has is she has her breads in 35 Whole Foods, and she's in million-dollar negotiations for an industrial gluten-free bakery. See how it works? Women are designed for massive change. We're here to create alliances to feed the whole. And we can't um, rely on men to move back into a model of sustainability where the most valuable commodity in any community is the well-being of the community landscapes because their time is taken up providing for their immediate loved ones. Women are here to change the whole. And so we understand this in the back of our minds, but what we want to do is we want to have it at the forefront of our movements. So here's my invitation. Given that you already have a footprint on this planet, and you already are an impact on your loved ones and everyone else that they touch, flesh out that vision that you've already had. Really work it into an impossible promise that's worth giving your life to. Step into some roles that fill you up. As a gatherer, keep your baskets full, but as a legacy builder, make the transition from unconscious material consumption to really collecting nourishment for yourself, quality nourishment for yourself and your visions, your families. When we can bring attention to what we feed our mouths, we can bring attention to what we take into our eyes and our ears. Then we can bring a little more control into what we take in at the heart level so we have the neutrality to settle in for the long haul. And we also then can have some control over what comes into our bank accounts and into our communities. Feed yourself voraciously. Take responsibility for who you are for the rest of us. And everything else kind of takes care of itself. Thank you. Thank you.